it um, and it will be sent to you in a post event email that will be sent sometime next week. Um, before we get started, just want to go over some general housekeeping items, such as um, if you could remain on mute um, while Dave and Doug are talking um, and while we're doing trivia, you guys are more than welcome to unmute to participate in conversation and um, ask questions and things like that. And then we'll also open it up for Q&A at the end as well. Um, before I go ahead and pass it over to Dave and Doug, I have a short little video from the Vice President of the Alumni Association, Jen Heisey. Today's program, one of many offered by your UC Alumni Association. Before we begin, it's important for me to say thank you for joining us. By actively participating in our offerings and experiences, you are harnessing the power of your alumni network. There are Bearcats all over the world, more than 315,000 alumni in 127 countries, which makes virtual programs like this so rewarding. These challenging times do come with a silver lining. We are more connected than ever before, creating boundless opportunities. The University of Cincinnati and each of you is stronger and better positioned because of our lifelong connections through our alma mater. We love providing opportunities like this one, where alumni can learn, network, and give back. So settle in and enjoy today's program. And if you like what you hear today, please share on social media using the hashtag ThyLoyalChildren. Thanks again for joining us. Go Bearcats. Okay, I'll go ahead and pass it on over to you, Dave. All right, Lauren, thank you very much. Thanks to all of you for joining us. This is a, a lot of fun to be able to, well, drink beer and tell the story of the Big Ash. Uh, I'm Dave Emery, uh, one of the many founders of this, uh, this brewery and the managing partner. And I'm here with Doug Chase, who is another one of the founding members of not only the brewery, but also the co-op that this came from. So we started this up back in 2011 in this beer cave, which is a basement under my garage. And we had 25 guys got together. It kicked in a couple hundred bucks and we started the Big Ash Brewing Company, we called it back then, even though it wasn't really a company. It was just a bunch of guys brewing beer and having a good time. And uh, after a while, uh, a few of us said, gee, well, let's, why don't we turn this into a real brewery? And so uh, a year and a half ago, a little more than that, September of 2019, we did that and hired a brewmaster, John, who couldn't be here this evening, but he's the uh, architect behind all these fantastic beers. And uh, so we have him to thank for that. Doug is a, uh, an official beer judge and a member of the American Society of Brewing Chemists. So he knows lots about the finer details of how beers are built and how to taste them and does sensory panels and all that kind of thing. So um, I guess that's probably enough uh, talking. Sure. Uh, I already violated the first rule of the brewery. Nobody starts talking until you got a beer in hand. So Doug, you are somehow you've gotten control of the cans, which you makes better me believe it. a little nervous already. Yep. But got to uh, be nice to me. What are we going to start off with here? So if if you um, I'm Doug, by the way, hello, thanks for joining us tonight. I hope you all enjoy everything. My understanding is we'll have some questions and answers at the end of the program. Um, so feel free to, to throw anything at us that you want to. Um, if we don't know the answer, we'll lie. Um, <laughs> with any luck, you've had enough beer by that point. You won't be able to tell the difference. Um, so in front of you, you've got some papers with any luck, um, a beer tasting scorecard. A, a another paper that's got a little bit more information, a little bit more graphics as far as what the individual beers are. And um, that should be about it. If you've got other stuff. Um, you're lucky. You're lucky. Use that's it as reference. Tell us what it is. Ho hopefully it's got some value to you. Um, so typically the way we run a, a tasting is we start with the lightest bodied, lightest flavored beer first. Um, because what we want to do is, is ease our taste buds into the process gently, especially when we've got multiple styles of, of beer to go through. So we're going to start this evening with the vanilla cream ale. So ah. I'm simply going to open the can. We're running kind of late. Happy hour usually starts at 
four o'clock. Happy hour is generally a little bit earlier than this, but we'll we'll do what we can to make this the happiest hour that we have in the day. It wasn't wasn't we didn't make the schedule, so take so, responsibility for that. So as we've we've got ourselves our beer and our handy little glass, everybody is is very anxious to to get it in their mouths and, and everything. But let's just take a moment to take a look at it. If you look at your beer tasting card, the first item on there is going to be appearance. What we want to do in 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 professionally made beer, we usually don't have a lot of these types of issues. I, um, I'm a judge for the, for the American Home Brewers Association as well. So what we do is we wanna look at the clarity of the beer, make sure it looks like it's supposed to. And I can tell you that in home brewed beer, sometimes it does not look like it's supposed to. But so <laughs> for something in a style of a cream ale, we want it to be clear, we want it to be sparkling, and we want it to have a nice golden amber color. And if, if we were gonna score this, we would probably score this fairly high because um, I can't see any particular flaws with it. Okay. What we wanna also look at when we're, when we're doing this, as, as um, I believe as John, you're holding your glass up, we've got a little bit of a, of a head retention there. That's a good strong pour. What we wanna do is pay attention to whether or not the carbonation is saturated into the beer. If we've got a good carbonated head on there, when we go to sniff it, it'll give us all the volatiles and aromatics so that we can kind of pick up some of the flavor notes that we're gonna taste once we put it in our mouth. So we're gonna do something next that's a little bit odd, but we're gonna just stick our nose in it. John, thanks for not filling that all the way up because you know then we gotta wipe it, you know, but so anyway, <laughs> just give it a sniff. And what we'll do is, is kind of kind of think about what we get out of that sniff. It makes me thirsty. It does make me thirsty too, but th that's, that's the next stage. We get taste after that. So if we've done our job correctly, you should get some, what we'll call carbonic bite. This is a highly carbonated beer. So you get a little bit of a bitter aroma in it. It's not coffee, it's really hard to identify. And that's the CO2. Um, the next strongest aroma you should get is probably vanilla because it's a vanilla cream beer. And then you might get a little bit of, of an odd aroma that might smell like cornflakes or something that you um, might remember from childhood. Um, having you know corn for dinner or, or things like that because we do do utilize corn as an adjunct in a cream ale to to make the body lighter in it um please don't let me delay you any further please yeah. have a drink now yeah thank you <laughs> thank you oh yeah so again we should we should get some of the same flavor attributes that we got in the aroma certainly the um the vanilla is there with any luck, everyone's getting the the uh, vanilla. Talked about the corn very briefly. That kind of softens it. We'll have the vanilla cream or the, the uh, backbeat in a minute. Um, but the corn softens it, makes it smoother, and that's that creaminess that we get out of it as well. So, the, so the this, the vanilla here is a uh, is a Madagascar bourbon vanilla. Madagascar bourbon. And and somebody uh, this was trying to glass of this big ass other day and said yes. Makes me think a little bit about a bourbon barrel beer, and yeah. and and that would be the reason why, because it's got that in there, and that adds the sweetness to it as well. Right. right. Yep. Yeah. The vanilla, the vanilla beans, the the um, yeah, the barrel aged bourbon, vanilla, yeah, vanilla beans. I can't talk. I haven't had enough beer. We'll get there. <laughs> yeah. But we have a saying that big ash beer it makes you smarter. The more you drink, the smarter you get. And so this is going to get better as we go along. Definitely. Trust me. And maybe not, but you won't notice. Neither will we. So, yeah, okay, so that's good. Uh, that's a sweet one. Yep. Um, yeah, easy so. to drink. You can, uh, you know, drink this whole can and uh, probably not go out for more drinks, but you know, just because we want to be safe and everything. But um, it's a pretty easy one to drink and maybe have a second one. Yeah, what's our, what's our ABV on this one? This is 5.5. .5 yep. And only 16 IBUs, so not hoppy at all. Nope. Very, very, very. No hoppy. hops, just nice and light, easy to drink. Yeah. So what we do when when we're thinking about the judging, we've had the uh, we've had the taste, so we would give the tasting side of it a score. Aftertaste, in a light bodied beer like this, we shouldn't have much of an aftertaste. It should come pretty clean away. Um, when you drink it, you just want another drink of it, and that's that's kind of the way that works. And that flows into the drinkability side of that as well, so that um, everyone has particular tastes. There's certainly people out there that like IPAs. There's certainly people out there that really only drink stouts and whatnot. So a lot of these um, scores are subjective. I mean, everyone's different in their tastes and preferences as far as beers are concerned. Yeah. 
Yeah, but that's an easy drinker. I mean, you can. Nice summer day sitting by the pool. Yeah. So, any questions? We won't get too deeply involved in a lot of stuff, but if you have any questions about flavor or attributes, things like that, please jump in. So this this is our, uh, our vanilla cream is in the Cincinnati's favorite beer contest. Last year, Big Ash took the uh, the grand prize, the number one position with our backbeat coffee blonde, and uh, this year. The backbeat coffee blonde got eliminated in the first round, which is just shocking. We're still mourning that, but our vanilla cream is in there. So you all have to get on there and vote uh, every round for vanilla cream. We're, we're counting on you. That's right. Um, yeah. So if, um, if you'd like to move on, or if you'd like to go ahead and crush this can, um, you know, do it, do what works for you. I'm going to go ahead and pour the next one, and that would be the coffee blonde. But you know, feel free to catch up if you need to. If somebody drops off their chair, we'll we'll let you take a nap um, as we as we move further through this. There's trivia though, so so wait to get really really deep until until the trivia is over. Okay. So next would be the coffee blonde, the backbeat. Okay. Yeah. So if, if we were doing this in a competitive environment, we would um, only pour about two ounces in a in a cup, and that would be all we would consume. We could ask the uh, the steward for another sip if we needed to spend more time with it. But um, when I've done homebrew competitions, we'll do a flight of about fifteen or eighteen beers. Um, so you really have to be strategic with with how you uh, consume this stuff. There, there are different um, philosophies as to whether you, you swallow the beer or drink the beer or um, spit the beer out. Um, I like to think that there's flavor components that we get as, as we swallow the beer. So I, I'm not a, not a spit beer out person. That and it seems like that's a travesty. That's, I mean, that's how, not right. how could you do that? It's not right. Okay, so I had to step away for a second because I wanted okay. to see if I could find this here. Yeah. This, isn't the, this isn't the official one. But this is the coffee from Luckman's Coffee around the corner. So the guys that own the coffee shop, uh, the Snyder Brothers, <clears throat> they are the band called Backbeat. So it's a, a Beatles British Invasion tribute band kind of, and they are just absolutely fantastic. So, so that's why we named the, the, the coffee blonde beer Backbeat because we named it after the guys in the band that made the coffee. This is a Guatemalan Huehue Tenango. One of the test questions should be spell Huey Huey Tenango in less than three minutes to win a prize. If you if you look at the can of Backbeat, there's a, uh, a artistic rendition of a coffee bean <laughs> that's got the uh, the members of the Backbeat band um, kind of drawn into that. It's a pretty cool yes, yes. pretty cool image. So on this one, we smell it, we look at it, we go through all the same process. Um, shouldn't have any significant differences than the, than the vanilla cream, except that the vanilla cream smells like vanilla. This is going to smell like anyone. Oh, you guys are muted. Wait, wait, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, again, we're looking for crystal clear. We're looking for something in an amber golden. Um, this 1 will be a little bit darker just because it doesn't have the corn component to it. It's all going to be, uh, barley. And, um, and then, of course, the coffee com component as well. We. We use coffee beans in the um, in the process. We're not actually adding coffee um, to the to the okay. beer. It used to be when there were coffee beers made, they were all dark beers, and they were actually adding espresso or coffee to those beers to bring that flavor through. It was somebody realized quite a few years ago that you could um, make a blonde beer by soaking beans, and uh, and so we've we've been the beneficiary of that. And we, we trade Luckman's beer for coffee. So it works out pretty good. We go down there with growlers and we get coffee and, and it's a, just t tons of beans. It's a win. pretty square deal. It is. So, so for the, for the new folks that just joined in, we're 7 beers ahead of you. So just kind of like, <laughs> let's, let's get this rolling. Okay. We got I'm, the, I'm Doug from big ash. This is Dave from big ash. And we already did the vanilla cream. So you want to sample that 1 rush ahead where you can save it for later. 
replay this and do it all over again. That's right. From what I understand, you'll get a video of this. And so you can sit and, and laugh at us some more. That's and, not till days later. So if they no. already opened the can, that's, that's not You have work. to go to Big Ash and buy some more beer. Get some more. Yep. Yeah. Okay. All right. So backbeat's good. We like backbeat. that. Yep. 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 Cincinnati's favorite beer, 2020. Top seller for us. So if you find a subtle beer that you're not getting a great deal of flavor out of, one of the things that you can do to enhance the, the attributes of the beer, swish it around in your mouth and then kind of pull air in through your mouth and, and breathe that in. Not too strong because you don't want to choke or drown, but um, that opens up aromatics. Just like if we've got a reasonable amount of foam on the beer, we can smell that and pull those aromatics out. You're essentially doing the same thing on your palate to be able to get that beer to open up and, and get into your sinuses. Stingy with this, I think, you know, like I said, two ounce pours. <laughs> two ounce pours. <laughs> Whose rule is that? That's the dumbest thing I've ever It is. Of. Yeah, it's a pretty dumb rule, especially when it's good beer. <laughs> when it's bad beer, you're thankful for that rule. <laughs> we can do this all day. We do do this all day. There's that. <laughs> okay. So we promised we'd keep it to two beers and then let your uh, organization do its thing. Um, my understanding is you've got a little bit of a um, trivia and some other um, programming stuff to go on. So Dave and I are going to sit here and drink beer and uh, watch you guys do what you do. And we're going to mute our computer so our snappy repartee won't be something that you can, uh, can get involved in. <laughs> um, enjoy. We'll be back in a minute. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Okay. Let me pull up the trivia. Um, as you all should have seen in the confirmation email, um, if you want, you can download the Poll Everywhere app, or you can go to pollev.com backslash UCAA to participate in the trivia, and I'll give everyone a minute or two to get that pulled up. And not for nothing, but I think we're giving prizes to the top three, and I think there's only like eight windows open, so your odds are high if you want to make sure you log into this thing. I mean, 10 trivia questions, taking home a swag bag full of UC, you know, product and other gear, so might as well opt in. Give you a little breather in between those two beers, delicious as they were. Does anyone need more time to get um, set up with trivia? I think, give me, give me 30 seconds, Lauren. You're good, John. I just realized maybe you were trying to talk to us and we, we weren't paying attention, so. Nope, you're good. We're good. Yep. Right, you guys can play trivia as well. We're not we're not discounting anybody if you guys want to opt in. Oh really? Okay. Well we'll listen and see if we can guess something here. <laughs> we should throw some big ash trivia questions into this whole thing. Too, I was I gonna say we could have probably collaborated a little harder on the trivia side. I I apologize for that. Yeah, well we could just do it on the fly, you know, it'd be good. Uh, yeah, I I feel the impromptu trivia component is probably gonna be the most fun, I think, at the end of this thing. Certainly. Okay. We'll go ahead and get started. All right, I think I'm the designated reader. So what year did the Ohio legislature charter and the city of Cincinnati establish the University of Cincinnati? Those options are 1870, 1889, 1901, 1907. I'm not actually playing, so if you have any issues, just yell it out and Lauren will help troubleshoot it. All right. It's going so fast. <laughs> you won. 
winning this thing. Abigail coming in second. I guess we only had three people answer that question. We're moving fast. We'll keep it up. There's still four more in this round. Um, again, it's, if you if you got the app up, just let, let us know if you're having any issues. I think we might be able to pause it, but if not, yep. we'll, we'll move on to number two. And also you have 15 seconds to answer each question. Yes, and speed count. Like if you if you answered in 15 seconds or with 14 seconds left versus 13 seconds, you get more points. So speed is important. All right, how many touchdowns did future Hall of Fame tight end? That's my own subjective thing. Travis Kelsey score during his UC career. How many TDs did Travis Kelsey score in his years with the Bearcats? Seven, 10, 11, or 15? Shockingly low totals across the board for somebody who's doing so well in the NFL. All right, we had 20% of the group got it. 10. Okay, got a few more names in there. Working up to it. Perfect. All right, on to the next one. What university was UC playing in football in 1914 when the nickname Bearcats was born? I won't read the options. You can see them. It's going to be one of these four. A lot of Southern-based universities besides Northwestern. Four, three, two. And it was the University of Kentucky. Seems like we had a pretty good consensus on that one compared to others. Abigail hopping up the boards. All right, back on number four, this famous filmmaker's father, that's three Fs, graduated from UC in 1949. Who's the filmmaker? Whose dad is a Bearcat? One of these four, you've probably heard of them all. Five seconds on the clock. Goes fast. If you answer Steven Spielberg, you are correct. Abigail just running away with it right now. But Matt, I see that coming up the, coming up the rankings after it's sitting out the first question. I like it. All right, number five of five until we get back to the beer. Is the current, oh, this is a, you know, this is a either or. Is the current number of living UC alumni over or under 350,000? You only got two options. Oh, forgot I wasn't muted. Oh, goodness, someone someone guessed right. We got the under, shockingly. I didn't even know that one. Matt taking the lead on that fifth and final question for the first round. We're going to have five more, right, Lauren? So there's, you know, these aren't final, but I guess we'll put a pin in the standings as they, as they lie and uh, yes. get back to drinking some beers. Yes. Dave, we're going to turn it back over to you. All right. Well, we, uh, Doug and I, we got the, uh got pretty much all those yeah i mean pretty close to you know, you know we didn't want to compete you know well i answered beer on all of them and i didn't i i'm i was confused clearly we've been drinking yeah. we've been drinking more big ash which makes us smarter, smarter. And so that's why we probably did so well for sure okay so rather than talk so much we're going to just go right into the beer Good so work. the next beer we're going to do is the buckeye stout pastry stout well, nope. no. Oh, are you going to do that for the schooner? Yes, oh. schooner's IPA. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. So we'll notice a little bit of a color and texture change in this beer. <laughs> Just a little. Just a little. So again, as we're kind of uh, poking around in that scorecard, we're going to give it an appearance. We're going to think about the aroma, taste, aftertaste, all that kind of good stuff. Um, if you guys want to turn your microphones on, I'm curious what people get as far as the aroma on this one. Yeah. 
and just throw things out at me. Coco? Sure. <laughs> Definitely a little bit of vanilla kind of milkshake almost. Yep. Yep, absolutely vanilla. We we uh, we're throwing that in there to to mellow it out a bit. So the reason I ask, um, this is a little bit more complex than than what we saw in the first two beers. Um, we've got a lot more going on. The darker the beer, typically the more complex it is as far as the flavor attributes and the aroma attributes. Um, so you're right with cocoa. You're absolutely correct with vanilla. Um, there's some lactose added to it to give it some of that pastry pastry quality. So you're going to get a little bit of um, milk chocolate type of type of aromas as well. Um, let's go ahead and taste it and see if we get all of those same things or see if something else comes through. And if you get something else, um, just let me know. I'm the only one not on mute, so peanut butter. Yep, absolutely. I was going to start saying, you know, anyone, anyone, <laughs> Bueller, Bueller, <laughs> Bueller, anyone. I'm too old for this. So, um, <laughs> so what we've done is we've taken our standard dreaming cow, which is just a, a regular normal stout. We've added a little bit more um, vanilla to it. We've added some some um, cacao nibs, and the cacao nibs are actually raw compressed cocoa, so it's more of a um, a bittersweet chocolate. But with the vanilla addition, it gives it more of a milk chocolate, smoother kind of kind of texture and flavor. We also, like I said, with a little bit of lactose to it, gives it that milky milk chocolate. So when you take a drink of it, especially if it's a little bit warmer and the flavors start to open up, it really starts to, to hit you as far as chocolate is concerned. And then we're also adding peanut to it to give it that a little bit of peanut butter nuance um, right at the finish. So that's where we get Buckeye because of the, of the candy with the chocolate and the peanut butter. Um, and then we're looking for a texture and a mouth feel for that, that pastry stout type of um, a situation. That's what the lactose does. And that's it, what right? the lactose, yeah. yep, absolutely. It gives you that mouth, mouth feel. So, and like I said, this is a little bit more complex than what we've seen before. The first two had pretty singular attributes as far as what you were looking for and what you were really going after. And as we get deeper into some of these beers, darker beers tend to have um, more dark roasted malt. So you can get um, like toast or uh, toffee flavors. You can just get a lot of different really cool flavors out of them. When I first tried this, when John um, had it and was sampling it, I got molasses. Um, but as it mellows out of the fermenter and as it gets into um, the stages where we where we really like it and want to sell it, that molasses kind of mellows out and turns into that milk chocolate Buckeye kind of flavor. So beers change and evolve over time. And um, so some beers age really, really well, some beers not so well. This is one that, that has improved with age as, as we've held on to it. It's just a really solid beer. Does anyone have any questions about that? Can there? Let me see. The can. I'm sorry. It's a beautiful can. So this is a most recent uh, release that we got, our Buckeye. And uh, the trivia question for you: Where does the name Buckeye come from? It's the state nut, right? But why do they call a Buckeye a Buckeye? If you look on the can, I think there's a clue. Because the buckeye nut looks like the eye of a buck. That's where that came from. Ah, <laughs> isn't that something? Very cool. Got some of those right out of our backyard. Yeah. You're, you're pretty good. No, never mind. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, that's pretty good. So this is a, pr a pretty new one. This was, uh, just came out a couple weeks ago and been real popular. Yep, very good beer. Yeah. It's a little, got a little more uh, ammunition uh, than the others at 8.4% ABV. So, um, yeah, you probably don't want to do 10 of those, at least not real quick. 
it, it's it's what we call a big beer and not just by size it's it's big in alcohol so it's it's um there there are other stouts and other heavier beers out there that are called like winter warmers things like that um if you think about um there are what triple stouts and quads and, and things like oh. that Belgian quads that have a lot of alcohol in them, you can get them up into the 12 and 13 and 14 ABV. The bourbon barrels. Bourbon barrels, like absolutely. Really, really and those are what we call winter warmers. And you want to sit in front of a fireplace on a snowy day like we had recently and yeah. just kind of like kick back and relax and think of nothing but beer. And um, we do that a lot, no matter what the weather is. because and, and you don't have to wait for the warm weather to return to, to drink this. Well, year. that's true. You can do it right now. Yeah, yeah, this is good beer. So if you're, <laughs> never mind. Um, let's move along. <laughs> next, so the next beer we've got is Schooner, which is a New England IPA. We saved this for last because as we get into the higher IBUs, the hoppier beers tend to fatigue our taste buds, and we can't taste more subtle, complex flavors. So you save your IPAs for later. Does anyone know what an IBU is? What that stands for? In the brewing industry, it's called the International Bitterness Unit. So they've got this scale, and it goes from zero to whatever the highest number is. People keep keep raising the bar on it, um, and it's just basically that. It's like the Scoville number for um, hot peppers. IBUs are the the level of bitterness. So if you're someone who's who likes really low mellow beers, you're going to stay in the in the 15 or below. If you like a little bit more, then you're going to get in the 20s, 25s. And if you want to go, you know, if you like your top of your head blown off, you're going to go into the, the high 20s and in the 30s and, you know, and on up. So, so this one's going to have a lot of complexity to it as well. The hops that John uses in this, he's working on a lot of different um, flavor characteristics in order to increase the complexity of this beer. So he's using a, he's using a, um, a trio of hops. So Citra is one of the primary ones that he uses. And just as the name implies, it gives a lot of citrus notes to it. So if we smell it and if we taste it, we're gonna pick up citrus. We can pick up pink grapefruit, blood orange, and then some navel orange as well. And then the other hop he uses is a mosaic. And what the mosaic does is that gives us a little bit of a resinous flavor. So that gives us our true I, I, uh, IPA um, notes. And by resin, what I mean is you get a little bit of notes of pine and juniper, things like that. And that's some of the traditional flavors and aromas that you can get in an IPA. He's added a, a newer hop out of New Zealand that's called a Brew One. And that one is a super tropical hop. So what that gives us is a lot of pineapple. Um, we go back into some of the citrusy notes with, with navel orange and sweetness, things like that. But you also can, um, can get hints of mango depending on how, how strong that hop is used in the brewing um, process. Um, how many people got all of that stuff when they tasted and smelled it? I didn't, but I'll be honest with you. I had COVID at the end of January and my taste buds and, and, um, and smell are, are still recovering. So there are some things that I'm still blatantly missing. I, I am enjoying all of these beers though. So, you know, it's still a, still a good thing. Luckily, because of COVID, I'm not doing any competitions right now. So hopefully I can get back into the swing of things. <laughs> yeah, this is. Uh, it's just the one one thing I've noticed about all of John's beers is the aromas come through really really well, and uh, the the aroma and the taste are one and the same. Yep. Uh, that's not always the case with um, a lot of the craft beers these days. Sometimes you, you know, the aroma is not there or it's off or different than than what you taste. But with uh, everything that John brews, I'm I'm already halfway through enjoying it before I even put it to my lips. Mm. I like that, and I love I love the the citra. We did a lot of those when in our beer cave here when we started brewing. Oh yeah, way back in the time, because it. Uh, I'm not, I'm not I'm not a real heavy bitter hop kind of guy. I don't like the really right. super bitter ones. I really like these ones. Got the uh, a lot of citra mosaic. Falconer's flight was another mm. another one we used all the time. That's a really good hop. Yep. Okay. Yeah. So you like that one? So we only have four beers this evening, but if you come to Big Ash, we have darn near 20. There's 20. We got 20 beers on tap. Um, most of them are ours. We have still a few kegs on there from the U.S. Uh, winners week. So the, uh, there was the uh, 
uh, U.S. Open Beer Championship back in December. Uh, it's a it's a national, actually international competition. Six thousand beers were submitted to it, and uh, our Porter's Porter got a gold medal in that. It was the second gold medal that we've earned with that. And so we decided to host all of the the breweries and beers that we could find and put them on tap at the Big Ash with our pour your own tap wall. So if you haven't been there, uh, you can check in, get a credit card, link it to an RFID card, just like a hotel door card, slides into the beer tap and you pour by the ounce. So you can do your own tasting and just sample an ounce at a time and then uh, decide which one you like the best and then get a pint of that. Uh, and come back and get as much as you want. And then, uh, and then when you check out, you just give us the card or toss it in the bucket and you're on your way. It's a really cool concept, a lot of fun. And uh, so we decided to get these other these other breweries that won these uh, the medals in this competition. So we have 12 of them up there, and I don't know, there's maybe maybe half of them left. Um, we still have some a few kegs in there, but uh, we've got uh, John's brewed. She said, I don't know, probably close to 40 different beers in the year and a half we've been going. And we've got also wine on tap and cider, seltzer, um, and then we got a full craft spirits bar as well. We right. Blend our own whiskey, and uh, have a thing called the Custom Bourbon Experience, where you can come visit, and come up with your own blend of bourbon, and enter that in an app, and a day later you can have a bottle behind the bar, or go pick it up around the corner at Brain Brew Whiskey in Newtown. It's very very cool. So. But enough of my infomercial, but wait, wait, there's more. Lauren, what are we supposed to be doing now? I was going to say, we can open it up for questions for you guys. If anyone has any questions or thoughts, anything, go ahead and unmute yourselves. Sure. Fire away. We have all the answers. I was going to say, what that what uh, is that process like when you're trying to you know perfect the taste of a beer when you're you know trying to create something new? Mm, that's fun. You want to cover that, or you want me to? Oh, you can do that. <laughs> so in in homebrew, um, it's a challenge because there's not a lot of technology behind us in the homebrew industry. Um, so it's it's really trial and error. You make a batch of beer, and if you don't like it, you find some poor sap that's really thirsty to drink it, so you can make another batch of beer. <laughs> Um, the nice thing about when you start to get into the industrial processes and even the, um, the micro brew and nano brewing processes, there's a lot of programming out there. So you can plug in the ingredients that you want to use. And like I was saying, with the, um, with the schooner, with the hops that he's using, you can generally start to work with the um, percentages of the hops that you want. And it'll start to give you some flavor, flavor profiles, things you can expect to see. And so you can kind of start out with an idea in the back of your head as, as far as what you want that flavor profile to be and then start tinkering around on the computer and come up with a recipe then that'll that'll you know get you where you want to go and we've got a, a small pilot system where we can make um, one barrel at a time and so if we really want to dial it in and do a small batch to test it um, that's that's how we'll do it there's a, a blueberry hellas that um, has been made on that pilot system several times that is is just outstanding um, so there's a lot of experimentation can go on in that that nano type of of uh, situation. And the, the brewing is you know it's uh, it's a lot of science, but it's also a lot of art. John uh, he spent two years getting his degree at Cincinnati State in brewing science, so he's really studied that. Uh, but it's also you you've got to have a palate and uh, know how to to you know dial in these different flavors. So it's a uh, very much of an art. So he. He frets and frets over, you know, the different hop combinations and how long you should leave the beans in for the coffee to get just to the right level. And uh, takes a lot of experience and experimenting to, to really yep. dial it in and make them great. He's really good at it. Other questions. So you guys are uh, is it all aspiring entrepreneurs or marketing folks or a little bit of all different backgrounds or? I'd say a little bit of all different backgrounds. Yeah, the, the general criterion is just to have been a graduate of the University of Cincinnati. So oh, okay. Okay. A, cool. a wide, wide reaching group. Yes. 
I was going to say, yeah. Well, so if you've ever, if you have, are any of you thinking of opening up a brewery? Oh, stupid <laughs> idea. It's, I was waiting for that. It's, it's really, really hard to do. Uh, Hi, I well, have a question. A lot of fun, but there's a lot of competition now. When we, when we started our co-op in 2011, I think there were five, five or six breweries. Mm -hmm. uh, Mount Carmel and Listerman were there. 50 West opened up the same year that we started our co-op. Rheingeist and Madtree. Uh, Rheingeist wasn't there yet. I don't think Rheingeist was, yeah. was there yet. Yeah. yeah. And so now there are, for the last count, I think 57 breweries in yeah. Cincinnati. So it's gotten very, very competitive. Yep. Braxton was a home brew club, just like just like we were um, when they got started. Here in the garage, yeah. Yep. Most everybody was doing some home brewing and and uh, but you know now it's there. You know, guys started one brewery, they broke off and then one started another. And but it's quite a it's a great uh, it's a great business to be in. A lot of fun to make beer and even meet, more fun to drink it. Meet people. Meet people. Yeah. Uh, it's a lot more though than just making beer and you know food and all that. You got to have a a. Uh, a lot of uh, sense of community. That's a great thing about craft breweries. Everybody's putting on events, hosting things. We've done a lot of fundraisers for nonprofit organizations, and we supported the raising of over two hundred thousand dollars for charity since COVID hit. So it's just uh, we turned everything into a, a fundraising machine that brings people in. They want to, they want to advertise to get people in to support the organization. We've done a lot of live streaming, and uh, they've. That's been very, very fruitful for the for the uh, nonprofits to be able to do that. We have live music uh, in the summer. We'll have it five nights a week, and we live stream all that from our beer garden. We have a blast, a lot of fun. Have all of you been down to the Big Ash yet? No, it's my favorite spot. Oh, that's good. That's good to hear. <laughs> I see some shaking their head. No, that's shameful. There's still, it's, there's still time. There's still time for redemption. Yep. Yeah, there's yep. absolutely time for redemption. Yep. This is the moment, turning point. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I live on the west side. It's just, it's, I don't get out of my little two, two yeah. mile shell. Yeah. Beyond the curvature of the earth, past <laughs> 75. Yeah. Well, we, yeah, we do let some of the west siders come in, but take their temperature, check for weapons. That's right. <laughs> Limited quantities. It's, it's worth the the road trip, honestly, because the um the pour your own system is the only one like it here in, in this region. Um, there are a couple of places that we're looking to get open just before COVID struck, and and of course they got slowed down by that. And um, my expectation is they'll probably open in the fall, but um, it's really a cool system. It's it's uh, you see them in places like San Francisco, Chicago, New York, Washington D.C. Um, you wouldn't think of a sleepy little town like Cincinnati having something so high tech and as cool as it is. I mean, literally, you go to the cashier and you get your RFID card, and the world is your oyster after that. You don't have to stand at a bar and wait for a bartender. You don't have to, you know, there's no line to stand in. You go and you grab a clean glass and you pour your beer. Um, then you go back to your table. If you want to get food, RFID covers the same exact thing. So it um, it's really crit pretty cool. As far as that that whole um, just that whole vibe is very mellow. There we go, right there. Yeah, I love using the ID card. The only problem is I'll forget to to put it in the wall after a couple beers. <laughs> yeah, or take it out of the wall. Well, we see that a lot too. <laughs> you know, if, if, if you don't put it in the wall, you get no beer. It's a very self manages thing. So that's the key to liquid knowledge. We call it, and uh, that's how the it works. The more you drink, the smarter you get. Yeah. Um, you know, I have a question. Yeah. What um, made both of you want to get into brewing and beer? Well, for me, uh, it's because I really like beer. I lived in Belgium for a couple years when I was about your age. Uh, and that was uh, uh, at the point when there was no such thing as craft beer in the good old United States of America, but all of these uh, incredible beers that come out of Belgium, we were drinking them all the way back then. The Trappist beers, you know, wheat beers, Hefeweizen, uh, the Krieg. I say Krieg. Oh, geez. Oh, that was just a cornucopia of an incredible range. And Bel Belgium's really the you know, beer 
beer mecca of the world. So when I was uh, 20 some years old, I was going to school over there and playing the guitar in the bars and cruising around and drinking as much Belgian beer as I could get my hands on. And that was a lot. And then when I got back here, it was just so depressing to have nothing but this Miller swill. And uh, it's like terrible. So uh, and I, I was really excited to get to the point of doing home brewing, which actually started in, gosh, in about, about 20 years ago, I started doing some home brewing. And we did that a few times. And that was a, my wife, you know, she was like, you're, you're done with this, making the mess in the kitchen, the boil overs on the stove. You're out of here. So we moved it out to the beer cave here, and that's when we started the co-op. So we got 25 guys involved in that, and uh, all kicked in 200 bucks, and then we started this co-op and started brewing here in our beer cave and took turns with it. So one week, guys would brew. The next couple of weeks later, they'd come in, and some other guys would bottle, and it kept a kind of a relay thing going. And uh, so that, uh, that made it sustainable and possible, and so that carried on for eight years, and we doubled the number of guys involved in it. And that made it much more enjoyable to do it together and do all the brewing here uh, in a co-op uh, fashion, as opposed to the typical homebrew club where everybody brews on their own that brings their beers together to, to, to compare them. So, and this was also a, a practice in how to run a business so that we got to do the real thing. We had some sort of clue as the complexities involved. Not much of a clue, but some. Very small. Very small. <laughs> My, my experience began when I was in college um, in 1988. Um, my future to become my wife, um, she and I had spent a little bit of time in Europe and experienced a lot of things that Dave's talking about with regards to European beers. And we, um, we settled at um, that other university. It's a couple hours north of here. And um, the, the best beer that could be consumed at that time was either Heineken in a green bottle or uh, Michelob, and and both of them were too expensive for the college budget. So you know that was back when um, Keystone had had started coming out as the cheap college beer with the Keystone face, bitter beer face, with that kind of thing. Um, so I started brewing beer in 1988, and um, I've probably personally brewed a couple thousand batches of beer home brew. Um, which is what led me into judging and, and all the different things that I, that I do with regards to the beer industry. Um, I come from a restaurant and service background. So, you know, working with the cave people um, here at Big Ash at, in the early stages um, just was a real no brainer as far as um, bringing some knowledge to the table. And then when, when Dave was talking about getting ready to open a brewery, um, it just seemed like a really easy answer to just, uh, to be a part of that as as things evolved, um, yeah. So, it you fall into different hobbies and different passions throughout your life. Um, a lot of them by accident. I mean, I, I uh, you know I, I'm still trying to figure out what I want to do when I grow up. I, I may never <laughs> never settle on one thing. <laughs> Thanks for sharing. Um, does anyone have any other questions before we move to the last five? questions of trivia. Yeah, I just wanted to ask, uh, where does uh, Big Ash go from here? What's the what's the plan? Well, that's a great question. Um, well, we are, uh, we just started canning our beer just a few months ago. So um, it's a very small canning system. So we can't uh, produce enough to line the shelves at Kroger. Um, the, the real high profit is in the tap room but you've got a little bit of a limit in terms of the volume you can crank out. So if we were to grow beyond that, we probably would, would look at doing opening up another location as opposed to going to distribution. Uh, the competition on the grocery store shelves is just the further you go, the you know higher up it goes and gets very, very difficult to compete. And with so many breweries out there, uh, I think I would rather go the route of Another location, another tap room, doing another tap wall, and focusing on the events and entertainment, which is what my my you know background and interests are. Uh, I think that, uh, that's definitely where we would head. We're right now we're looking at uh, expanding, building a big uh, a deck uh, covered deck 
uh, a, a cigar bar gazebo, a grill station out front that would be the size of the inside building, almost almost double our space, probably increased by about you know, 50% at least. And um, there's um, an apartment complex that's being built behind us. So the old grocery store and all that strip mall is getting torn down and they'll build uh, 360 apartments back there. So that's gonna change things up for us. So we'll uh, we'll be looking at uh, kind of trying to, you know, do that growth right there, increase the business, uh, try to get the cost under control, the revenue up with some more customers and trying to make enough money that I can retire somewhere before I'm 85 is my goal. I think it would be good. It's ambitious. Maybe I can do it. You only have 40. Are you guys going to keep the, uh, the outside where you guys had uh, music and stuff going on during COVID? Are you going to keep that? As long as we can. Yeah. The construction is going to start sometime this year on the, uh, on the back there. Um, but we're, um, we're hoping we can hang on to this throughout the summer. I think we'll be able to. They probably won't start building until the end of the year. Uh, the demolition is probably going to happen sometime in this, this summer. So I just am talking to the guys at the developers that have bought the, the property and uh, trying to figure out what their schedule is and how to work it out. We're, we've got all sorts of just crazy plans of uh, looking at the, the possibility of putting a circus out there, the Cincinnati Circus Company. Roll that out for a month, a big car show. Uh, we got Noah Hunt, who's our local uh, you know, triple platinum uh, recording artist. He's going to play again. Uh, so we've got just all sorts of all sorts of big fundraiser plans. Dan Varner is another local talent there. He's going to be a, doing a big fundraiser there. So we could, you know, keep that that parking lot full all summer long, as long as they don't roll the bulldozers in too far. And too fast, so we're we're hoping that made that saved us this summer being able to do that. It's really, a, incredibly lucky. A lot of other places they got a sidewalk, and a small inside space, and this whole COVID thing has really creamed them. Definitely. Well, thank you, Dave, and thank you, Doug. Our pleasure, Lauren. Thank you. It's been a treat. Can we finish the rest of the beer now? Yes, we can finish the rest of the beer now. Which would you like? <laughs> I'd like a schooner, please. Schooner, please. Here we go. Thank you. Okay, we'll go into the last five questions of trivia. Let me look at that one. Still need a formalized reader. <clears throat> yes. All right. All right, here we go. This shoe company was launched by a former Bearcat soccer player and New Zealand national footballer. And that company's name is Albert's Nike No Bulls Adidas. Not sure if everyone made it back onto their apps or whatever, but hopefully you did because it just hit zero. All right, half the group got it. We wish a Bearcat founded Adidas. That'd be fun. Fun branding opportunity. All right, we got a tie up top. Matt, the elusive Matt. All right, fair enough. Who was the first woman president of the University of Cincinnati? You see the options. I won't. I won't need them. Two, one. Oh, Nancy Zemfer. That was the answer we were looking for. Reeve shall name also important in UC history, but not for that question. All right. Question number eight. Yeah. UC football has three traveling trophies that hallmark individual rivalries with other schools. Which of the following is not the name of the trophy slash rivalry and the associated school? So you're going to pick the one that does not fit in with our football rivalry. Uh, 
one of these things is not like the other. Also for Cincinnati sports fans, Xavier is in overtime with Butler. I happen to be noticing that over my shoulder. The Ohio Cup with Ohio State, that doesn't exist, mainly because our record would be O oh, and a bunch. So there we go. I, I, I'm i surprised at how many people were got caught by that one. I don't, Abigail and Matt either aren't answering anymore or have just been on a cold streak because we're sitting pretty even at the top of the leaderboard. Number nine, one question left after this. Albert Hegg, CCM graduate, don't quote me on the last name, Compose the theme song and score for which of the following animated holiday television specials originally released in 1966? Oh, so many classics. Which one did he make? Make the score to. One second left. Wow, pretty even distribution. It was How the Grinch Stole Christmas, though. That might put someone over and above. Eh, it's Abigail. She's still in this. Okay. 5,000 is the top. We got one more left. Might be able to take it if you answer fast enough. Who is the local benefactor that organized and founded the Medical College of Ohio in 1819, which would later be merged with the Cincinnati College to form the University of Cincinnati? It's a lot. There's a lot going on with that question. Daniel Pike. My name's Proctor. Wow. Yeah. I don't know. Drake. Yeah. Could you could be right? I think you I think you might have it. Daniel Drake was was the one. <laughs> Did the people listen? Oh, some movement up top, but. It ends up pretty much being a, a pretty clear cut top three. I feel like Abigail, Tyler, and Matt, you guys are getting some swag bags courtesy of Lauren. So congratulations. Everyone else, you're just getting drunk. So congratulations. To them. <laughs> Everyone wins. <laughs> so I think the winner of the trivia contest should, uh, should get another four pack of big ass beer. That's your prize for winning. But there's one more trivia question. So yes. after hearing all about the history of the Big Ash and the co-op, whose idea was it really to start Big Ash Brewing? Divine intervention. Your, yes. your wife kicking you out? You got it. <laughs> got another four pack for uh, Jared there. <laughs> so divine intervention is a good answer. <laughs> I'm sure I'll be there soon anyway. She kicked us out of the kitchen, made us come down to the beer cave, and after there were 50 guys down here brewing beer, she said, get out of here. So we had to move over there. So it's all her idea. Tell her that. <laughs> well, Again, I want to thank you, Dave and Doug, for partnering with us and for leading us through this tasting this evening. Um, we really appreciate it. Um, and then thank you for everyone for tuning in. We hope you enjoyed the beers, enjoyed the trivia. Um, and for the top three winners, Matt, Tyler, and Abigail, I will be in touch about your prizes. Matt, did you just join up at the last second? This is the first we've seen you over there. I like it. I like the style. I, I think, yeah, I figured I'd show my face. You know what? <laughs> Come in for that victory on the trivia side. I like it. <laughs> Big moves. Anyway, well, yes. thank you guys for Brand, everyone. Thanks so much, Jared. Thanks for setting this up. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yes. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Have Dave. a good night. Appreciate it. Good night. Cheers, everybody.